Good morning, Grade 7, and welcome to another lesson brought to you by Worksheet Cloud Grade 7 Natural Sciences. If you have a question during this lesson, send an email with your question to grade 7 at worksheetcloud.com. Today's lesson, Grade 7, is on symbiosis, the art of living together. My name is Mrs. Hall, and I look forward to teaching you this lesson today. So let's start off with a definition of symbiosis. It is basically a relationship between two types of animals or plants in which each provides for the other the conditions necessary for its continued existence. It is a term describing any relationship or interaction between two dissimilar organisms. The specific kind of symbiosis depends on whether either or both of the organisms benefit from the relationship. So let's take a closer look. As you know, planet Earth is inhabited by millions of species. Different species often inhabit the same spaces and share or compete for the same resources. They interact in a variety of ways known collectively as symbiosis. There are five main types of symbiotic relationships that we are going to look at. We are going to look at mutualism, commensalism, predation, parasitism and competition. So let's get started with mutualism. Now to explore the different relationships that we're looking at today, let's consider a natural ecosystem such as the ocean. Oceanic environments are known for their species diversity, so it's a good example to use. If we were in the warm waters of the Pacific or Indian Oceans, we would likely spot an excellent example of mutualism. Now, mutualism describes the ecological interaction between two or more species where each species has a net benefit. So they're both going to benefit. Mutualism is a common type of ecological interaction. Let's take a look at the clownfish and an anemone. The symbiotic relationship between an anemone and a clownfish is a classic example of two organisms benefiting the other. The anemone provides a clownfish with protection and shelter, while the clownfish provides the anemone nutrients in the form of waste, while also scaring off potential predator fish. Now, sea anemones live attached to the surface of coral reefs. They trap their prey with stinging cells called nematocysts, which are located on their tentacles. Nematocysts release toxins when a small animal contacts an anemone's tentacle. This paralyzes the stung animal, allowing the anemone to easily bring the animal into its mouth for ingestion. Now, while other fish succumb to these toxic stings from the anemone, clownfish secrete a substance in the mucus covering their bodies that suppresses the firing of these nematocysts. This allows the clownfish to swim comfortably between the tentacles of the anemones, creating a protected environment in which potential predators are killed off by the anemone stings. A very clever little relationship. This clearly benefits the clownfish. But how about the sea anemones? The brightly colored clownfish attract other fish as well, looking for a delicious meal. These unsuspecting would-be predators are then caught and eaten by the anemones. Let's take a closer look at commensalism. Now, as we continue on our deep sea voyage, we may observe the commensalistic relationship 
that exists between barnacles and humpback whales. Commensalism happens when one species lives with, on, or in another species, known as the host. The host species neither benefits nor is harmed from the relationship. So, various species of barnacles attach themselves to the skin of whales, as you can see over here. Scientists have not discovered the exact mechanism by which barnacles are able to do this, but it does not appear to bother the whales. But how do the barnacles benefit from this unlikely relationship? The huge whales transport the tiny barnacles to plankton-rich waters where both species actually feast upon the abundant microorganisms that live there. Now some symbiotic relationships do cause harm and we're going to look at this one now, predation. Right, in predation one species, the predator, hunts and kills another species, the prey. One of the better studied predators in the ocean is the orca, or killer whale. They are found in every ocean on earth, and orcas are categorized as apex predators. Though they hunt and eat numerous other organisms, about 140 other species, orcas themselves are not hunted by any other predator. In other words, they are the top of the food chain. Now our next symbiotic relationship we're going to take a look at is parasitism, parasites. Now another harmful relationship is parasitism. This happens when one species, the parasite, lives with, on or in a host species at the expense of the host species. Unlike in predation, the host is not immediately killed by the parasite, though it may sicken and die over time. Here we have an example of very common parasites found in the ocean. Nematodes, leeches and barnacles. What do you think this is, grade sevens? Yes, it's a leech. Very scary looking. Take a good look at its mouth and there's its eye. Mm, quite an ugly looking little creature, isn't it? Right, now, though barnacles exist commensally with whales, they are parasites for swimming crabs. A, bar a barnacle may root itself within a crab's reproductive system. While the crab does not die from this interaction, its reproductive, reproduction, reproductive excuse me, capabilities are greatly diminished. And here you can see the barnacles attaching themselves to the swimming crab. We can also speak about competition. Now the last example we will explore in the ocean habitat is competition. It is the struggle among organisms for the same limited resources in an ecosystem. Competition can happen between members of the same species in trap specific competition and between different species in ter-specific competition. Okay, let's take a look. So over here we have an example of inter-specific competition in the ocean. It is the relationship between corals and sponges. Sponges are very abundant in coral reefs. If they become too successful, however, they take needed food and other resources from the corals that make up the reef. Sponges may, uh, may compete with corals for resources in the short term, but if too many corals die, the reef itself becomes damaged. This is bad for the sponges, which may themselves begin to die off until the reef is balanced again. So here we have an example. Symbiotic relationships can be useful measures of an ecosystem's health.
For example, large tracts of coral reefs are severely damaged or dead because of recent increases in ocean temperatures due to climate change. The temperature increases, or sorry, the temperature uh, increase induces coral to expel the algae that live mutualistically within them. So a mutualistic relationship, both benefit. So the algae and the coral live together and they both benefit. However, without the algae, the coral turn white and die. The loss of symbiosis is an early sign of declining coral health and speaks to the importance not only of studying symbiosis within marine environments, but also of examining the negative impacts that humans can have on these interactions. Right, take a look at this beautiful picture over here. In the words of National Geographic explorer Sylvia Earle, we need to respect the oceans and take care of them as if our lives depend on it, because they do. Right, let's take a look at everyday mutualism examples, just to recap and consolidate all the different relationships we have learned about with symbiosis today. So let's take a look at the mutualistic relationship or association between acacia plants and the ants that live on them. If you can see in the picture over here, you can actually see the ants on the branches over there. The plants provide food and accommodation in the form um, of food bodies and nectar, as well as hollow thorns which can be used as nests for the ants. The ants return this favour to the acacia tree by protecting the plant against the herbivores that come and eat them. So they'll actually attack the animals that come and try to eat the acacia. Here's another very good mutualistic example. You all can recognise that. It's um, one of the most um, beautifully um, seen animals in our national reserves. So oxpeckers are birds that are commonly found on the sub-Saharan African savanna. They can often be seen sitting on buffalo, giraffes, impalas and other large mammals. They feed on insects that are commonly found on these grazing animals, as you can see in the picture. Their job is to remove ticks, fleas, lice and other bugs. And this is a valuable surface as, service as these insects can cause infection and disease to these animals. In addition to parasite and pest removal for free, ox pickers will also alert the herd to the presence of predators by giving a loud warning call. This defense mechanism provides protection for the ox picker as well as the grazing animals. Isn't this just a gorgeous picture, grade sevens? Right, moving on, let's take a look at commensalism examples. So mites, ooh, may be the ultimate commensals. These tiny arachnids, now arachnids are spiders, live on the bodies or in the nests of thousands of different kinds of species, including us humans. While some mites are parasitic, most are far too small and passive to have any effect. Hmm. Funny looking creature, isn't it? Look closely at those eyelashes, grade sevens. What do you think that is? Several species of commensal mites have evolved specifically to live on humans. Eek. Notably, notably Demodex folliculorum, which is probably on your skin right now. Let's take a look at pseudoscorpions. Now these are also tiny arachnids. They max out at about half an inch long. They look like scorpions without stings. Okay, so they're pseudoscorpions. They look like them, but they don't have the sting. They practice a kind of commensalism called forestry, in which an organism uses another for transportation. So basically they hitch a free ride. Pseudoscorpions hitch rides under the wing covers of large beetles or in the fur of mammals. 
as long as the pseudoscorpion is riding a large animal, it's comparatively safe from predators, and it gets the opportunity to drop off in a more profitable space, something that is beneficial to it. Some pseudoscorpions do snag parasites off their hosts, making them mutualistic so it benefits both of them, but most of them are just there for the free ride. Let's now take a look at parasitism examples. Mm, this one kind of freaks me out a little bit. So tapeworms are intestinal parasites that are shaped like a tape measure, as you can see in this picture over here. A parasite is an animal or plant that lives inside another animal or plant. And remember, parasitism, parasitism is where one animal or the plant is harmed. A tapeworm cannot live freely on its own. It survives within the gut of animals, including us humans. Tapeworm eggs normally enter the human host from animals via food, especially raw or undercooked meat. So make sure that meat is cooked grade 7 on the bri. Humans can also become infected if there is contact with animal feces or contaminated water. When an infection is passed from an animal to a human, it is called zoonosis. And grade sevens, as always, I like to end off with a little bit of humor. Okay, so here we have our hippo being cleaned by our ox picker, lovely clean teeth, and its body clean of all those little pests like fleas and ticks. And over here we have a rhino. One of the downsides to the symbiotic relationship is, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Just hitching a free ride. Um, and then this was also quite cute, parasite job hunting, the famous leech, okay? What kind of openings do you have? In other words, how do I get inside? And over here, this little doggy asking the worm, what do you have to offer if I decide to host you in my gastrointestinal tract? So what type of relationship would this be? Would it be mutualistic? Because the dog's asking, what kind of... Um, what do you have to offer me? Okay, will it benefit both of them? Absolutely not. It is a parasitic symbiotic relationship. Okay, the worm causes harm to the dog. Right, grade sevens, I hope you've enjoyed watching this lesson. I thoroughly enjoyed giving it. I learned a little bit myself, um, especially about the mites. Ooh, that freaked me out quite a bit. Don't forget to download the worksheet and to do a little bit of homework. I hope you enjoyed this lesson and I hope you learned something new today. I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care, grade sevens.